All right, Marginal Gains listeners, I have a real treat for you today. Uh, very timely. This is probably the, the quickest we've ever been uh, on top of an actual uh, racing event uh, following up on our Everesting episode. And that is today I've got Ronan McLaughlin, uh, who has just taken this last weekend uh, the Everesting world record, taken it away from Alberto Contador of all people. Uh, for those of you who, who listen to this podcast, you know how happy this makes me. Uh, has just taken this record by more than 20 minutes. 20 minutes. So please help me welcome to the show, uh, Ronan. It's so nice to meet you. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Uh, still, uh, still can't quite believe what's happened and can't quite believe that I'm on the Marginal Gains show. It's just incredible. <laughs> well, well, I have to say, I, I was thrilled. I, I woke up that morning after it happened to find an email from you that said, you know, here's an article in Cycling Tips about the bike and huge thanks because I listened to the podcast and used the chain lube and the pressure calculator and all these tools that we had put out. And it, it was just one of the, uh, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, I was, it made me feel so proud uh, and, and happy. I said, oh, we, we have got to talk. <laughs> so, so one, thank you for reaching out. Uh, and two, um, I mean, I guess let, let's start with you and your background. I mean, well, yeah, I've been, uh, I suppose I've been competitive cyclist for 15 years, six of which I spent at uh, UCI continental level, uh, with the Alan Post Sean Kelly team, uh, and sort of, Left that, as I always call it, left that never never land of pro racing in, in 2013 and uh, moved back to Ireland um, sort of settled down, worked my way through a few jobs, got married um, have a have a have a have a daughter now. And, you know, but at the same time, I, I never, never give up that uh, racing element of, of my of my bike. And I just love racing. And uh, although I've tried to give up a few times and I've thought about it and I've even thought about it since the Everesting last week but every time I do think about it I think you know I just enjoy it too much why why stop why you know let's just keep going so yeah I suppose that's a very brief background there, there was a lot more to it than that across the past 15 years but yeah, yeah so but so you're a coach also I am yeah I've, uh, I'm coach with Panache Coaching okay um, but yeah I've, I've sort of got quite a few hats in cycling I'm I'm a coach, as you were saying. I also, my full-time job is going around schools for the UK charity Sustrans. Uh, and my job in schools is to encourage kids to walk and cycle to school rather than to take the car. Uh, I'm also the chairperson of Foyle Cycling Club. I'm executive director on the board of Cycling Ireland. Uh, and I'm a rep in Ireland for Pac Timo Custom Clothing. So uh, okay. quite, quite a few hats. We better not wear them all today, but... <laughs> And in your spare time, you're breaking records. So with all, yeah, with all those so, yeah. I don't uh, even have seven hours to spare, but I managed to find it on Thursday. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. No, that's that's amazing. I mean, I love the advocacy, the industry involvement, the, the coaching, the giving back. It's, it, it's just super impressive, super impressive. So I think one of the things that, that stuck out to me in, in your initial email and, and the ones we traded afterwards is you know, clearly you've got the the performance capabilities, right? You've, you've got the body, the build, the engine, um, but you are, you are a very technical geeky cyclist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I've, I've, I've got the engine to, to ride at 300 Watts. I'm not so good above 300 Watts and I'm not much good below it, but I can ride at 300 Watts. So that, that, that worked out quite well for the Everesting. Uh, and then, yeah, the, the technical side of it, um, although, you know, I'm not the most scientific or uh, I'm not qualified in any way that way, but I definitely love geeking out on, on my bikes now. And yeah. I, I have a theory that the only reason I do time trials and hill climbs is to give me a reason to justify messing with my bike for about two or three weeks beforehand and trying to find every <laughs> marginal gain that I possibly can. And, oh, you know, sometimes probably costing myself more than I'm gaining, but uh, at least I'm having fun in the process. Yeah. No, that's awesome. So, so have you have you always been at the the more technical interest side of the sport, or is that something that you've grown into? Uh, no, I've definitely. I, I don't know why, but I've definitely always had that sort of um, that interest. Uh, I remember as far back as two thousand eight, two thousand nine, I would 
you know, get pockets taken off a standard jersey and getting it sewn onto my wrist skin suit. And, you know, that was years before Castelli launched the San Remo suit. And uh, I remember before it was illegal putting covers over my standard road helmet to try and make an aero road helmet. And uh, yeah, every, every little advantage every year, you know, the, the team used to be fairly, uh, Pretty really annoyed with me for the amount of changes that I did to the bike, and you know, not using sponsor correct clothing and all sorts of stuff. That just, uh, you know, to me it was. I, I always thought I haven't got the biggest engine in the peloton uh, in terms of my physical engine. I don't mean anybody's got an engine on their bike or anything, but <laughs> I haven't got the biggest physical engine. Uh, so I was just always trying to maximize every opportunity that I had. Like, and uh, yeah, I just find it interesting as well. No, oh, that's awesome. So, so I guess with that as a jumping off point let's let's talk about this bike uh we'll, we'll put some pictures up of it here as we we talk through it but i guess just run me run me through sort of your uh you know your thought process and and the tools that you were using as you went about optimizing and, and yeah. how long did it take was it a couple of weeks to to set the bike up or were you working on this for uh, about 12 hours <laughs> okay <laughs> the, the, the day before <laughs> Uh, maybe even less, um, but it, you know, it, it is my everyday road bike as well that I had to train on. Um, so you know, I didn't want to be riding around training with the, the bottom half of the handlebars cut off. Uh, I needed a few extra gears for training as well. So, um, long story short, I, I did do an Everest thing about two and a half weeks earlier. Um, I did eight hours and, and nine minutes for that one, which you know also put me inside the top ten in the world. Um, but for that attempt. I really sort of erred on the side of caution with everything. So uh, I, I genuinely didn't know was it possible to write up this claim that I had selected 64 times because it is, it's 24 and a half percent of the top. Um, and yeah, I, like the whole part of the reason for selecting the claim was that when I started cycling, I used to cycle over to it just to try and get up at once, once without walking. <laughs> um, so it was kind of a nice full circle thing to come back and do it 64 times. So yeah, like I left, I left quite a few, um, gains on the table that day just being fearful would I be able to get through the event or not so um, when I finished and with such a good time I, I knew immediately that you know I had quite a lot left on me and um, so then I set about thinking about you know what extra parts of the bike could I take off that weren't, wouldn't be essential and that meant that I took off the aero handlebars that I have which wouldn't be the lightest and um, and I think I just go to that first because it's the most obvious thing about the bike that I put on a set of three two three T Ergosum bars that I had in the house here, and um, I left it at that to start with. I put on super record EPS levers that I had on another a fifty one uh, bike that I have, so I took the EPS record, super record levers off that, transferred them across, took off the front derailleur, took off the fifty three chain ring, uh, took off all the cassette except the twenty five, the twenty eight, and the thirty two tooth sprockets uh, I added in some single speed spacers just to you know keep it all together yeah. uh, and then removed things like the bottle cage bottle cage bolts and I put on tri rig sticks skewers and uh, Omega front brake just trying to remember it all in my head now yeah yeah <laughs> but yeah so I did all this the night before and um, I had a chain that I had used previously put about a hundred miles on it to try and wear it in and then I had it sitting in the super secret loop for about three weeks. Uh, <laughs> took that out the night before to let it dry off completely uh, and put it into the bike the next morning. Uh, and then just about half an hour, 20 minutes before I got in the car to, to drive over to the bottom of the climb, I got out a hacksaw and cut off the bottom half of the handlebar. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just a case of the more I looked at them, the more I thought I didn't use the drops the first time. And if yeah. I finish up with eight hours, zero minutes and one second, I'll be thinking, well, why didn't I take off the drops? That could have been one second. Right. Um, so yeah, they, they, they had to go. No, it's, it, it's an awesome move. I mean that, you know, we talk about how, just how bad a cylinder is hanging out in the wind yeah. and that's as cylinder as it gets and as hanging out in the wind as it gets. Right. <laughs> right. So yeah, exactly. And you know, the whole focus is, uh, that it was on saving weight and yes it did save me 69 grams but it was also that cylindrical shape sitting out in the wind that was for yeah. forefront of my mind that the descent is so steep that I wasn't going to be able to pedal anyway so I decided not to take the gears for the descent um, but I was also conscious that from the calculations that I had done 
by being arrow or not arrow on the descent, I could lose up to 10 or 15 minutes um, yeah. because I was doing it 80 times on the second attempt uh, using a shorter segment. So uh, that, that was as much of a reason as, as the weight saving. Um, and, you know, just to put it into perspective, I, I had looked at getting a carbon version of the saddle that I use. It would have cost 250 pounds sterling and it would have saved me 69 grams. Um, whereas the, the ends of the bars that I cut off saved me right. 69 grams free. So, For free. And also give me an arrow gain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's one of the, I, I think one of the, you know, I briefly talked before we got on here, but one of the things that's so fascinating uh, about this attempt is that the way the hill, the, the climb gets so steep at the top and the decision to not, you know, not have any downhill pedaling gear. You know, when, when we did the, the first episode, we kind of theorized like a, you know, a cassette that was like an 11, 12, 28, 30. <laughs> and, and you eliminated the need for, for half of that, um, or, you know, by just picking I mean, the, the climb you've got. And I love this, this idea of just make the turn and tuck and it becomes a gravity race at that point which you know, the the engineer in me the gravity race is a really interesting problem to solve mathematically right because it's yeah go oh, ahead sorry oh i was gonna say yeah because it, it it a lot of these arrow gains i think we think of as affecting top speed but they really affect how quickly you get to top speed and and so you have this uh you know this increased acceleration and this increased uh, top speed piece. And I, I know having done uh, years ago, I did a, uh, a good bit of work um, in uh, uh, soapbox derby uh, for some, some people, some aero analysis and, and uh, it's, it's the same thing, right? It's, you know, there are actually cases where you might even be worth giving up the, the tiniest top speed advantage to get to that speed faster um, as you play with the aerodynamics and that just it, in a way made it an even more fascinating problem for me to think about in my my math brain <laughs> so yeah and i have uh unfortunately i have no experience in the soapbox derbies but it was a, a big part of my consideration and and the the new segment that i used for the second attempt uh, i cut out a flatter section at the bottom that i used the first time just to give myself some recovery time it's not flat but it's flatter um but then where i turned at the top the reason I turned there was because, first of all, it was 24 and a half percent. And as soon as I got myself over that, I could do an effort to get over that. And then I would immediately have the descent to recover. But also that 24 and a half percent was going to help me compensate for the fact that I didn't have a gear to accelerate in. And yeah, yeah like, it was something I was very conscious of that I, I, I was maybe going to lose some, you know, some of my descending gains because I couldn't get myself accelerated quick enough and um, I did try to make some calculations on it and uh, I'm not sure if I ended up uh, rightly or wrongly but one, one of the things I definitely looked at was running a mechanical group set so that I could so that I could do the 11, 12, 28 and 32 uh, sprockets um, but just with the EPS, the electronic setup, um, I wasn't sort of prepared to completely confuse this the system's uh, yeah. power unit and interface and you know yeah. get halfway through and not have any gears then so right uh, right right yeah. oh, and, and I as much as we've talked about it I've never actually tried to set it up but I think there's there's a pretty big question about whether that you can actually get the derailleur to make that climb right <laughs> right to go from yeah. a 12 to a 28 um, you know, I you could end up taking the hanger off it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. There's, there, there's no the, the shift ramps don't go that far down on that twenty-eight, <laughs> right? To pick to pick up off the twelve. So it, you know, it very well may actually not even work. But I, I it's fun to think about. It's fun to Definitely, think about. So, um, so total total bike weight was where are you? Well, with the caveat that I was using a set of scales that I bought on the way to an airport one time because okay. I was panicked about the fact that my my case might be too heavy those scales were telling me 6.2 kilos 16. Um, it's it's still in its everesting state um, so i am going to have it accurately weighed um, but that's by no means a, a weight weenies super light yeah. bike uh, it was as light as i could possibly get it um, right, right. but yeah 6.2 okay and, and you're you're a tall guy right it's or... a 56 frame i'm, I'm buying okay. on six foot okay Okay, you just 
I couldn't tell from looking at the pictures, you've got nice Z post extension. And um, I mean, your position looks awesome. That slam stem and <laughs> like, like that's, that's, it's a very pro setup. Um, it's, uh, it's all about, it's all about the look, isn't it? Like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> the position. Uh, no, the, the slam stem actually is a good, good topic to bring up. It's actually, uh, yes, it allows me to get my correct saddle uh, or bar height for, for me personally, but one of the things I like about that stem is that it's got a tiny little hole just below or just behind the the clamp and, and bar uh, area where you can get the Campag EPS interface inside the stem and then the cables Ooh, can come okay. out the hole. So just a nice way to hide the that's why I use that particular one because I could hide the interface out of the out of the wind inside the stem. Yeah. It's every little bit helps, right? I mean we know those <laughs> the wires, the batter, all that stuff hanging out in the wind. Um yeah, I love too that you went with the uh, the the arrow the tri rig break uh, and the, and the sticks skewers. I mean, it's I think those are things that I see pro tour teams continuing to overlook, uh, particularly on the the, the skewer side, <laughs> right? And and they make huge differences. And yeah, it was just another one of those things that when I looked at it, it was just like so obvious that you know. This is something I can't not do. This yep. is something I have to do. Like there's, there's so many things I could, I could, you know, uh, F's or bots about. But you know, that was just those two things where this has to be done. Yeah, yeah. So one of the questions that, uh, that that came up to ask you when we we posted on Facebook asking, you know, what what should we ask? And and uh, one of them was, you know, how does it feel to take the record away from a tour champion? But my personal question is, how does it feel to take it away from Contador? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I think the the global media are giving it much more attention because of taking it away from from Contador. But uh, I suppose uh, for for those in Irish cycling, um, they they might uh, they might be able to uh, console Contador in some little bit, and that you know he's lost it to a person who's won the the Shea Elliott Memorial Race twice. So uh, for any for anybody in Irish cycling, that means more than the Tour de France. So um, I'm, I'm not sure if that'll be any consolation to him or not. But Shea Elliott was the first Irish rider to wear the yellow jersey in the Tour de France, and he, he he died in tragic circumstances. And I've been fortunate enough to to win his Memorial Race in 2018 and 2019, the past two editions of it. And the, the only other person to win it twice in the row was Sean Kelly. So that's. Uh, it's something that I'm as equally proud of as, as the ever yeah. record. That's pretty good company uh, right there. <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah, certainly. It's uh, any any, any uh, day that you get mentioned in the same sentence as Sean Kelly or Alberto, Alberto Contador tends to, be, tends to be a good day. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, one of our other questions that came in, and we pull some of these up here. Um, let's talk diet. The, we've got numerous questions like what? Did you do anything like, you know, to try to shed weight, crazy diet? Um, I've got like three different diet related questions. So I'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll go broad with it and you, you tell me. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll give you the honest answer. Um, and uh, it's by no means something that I recommend. Um, it's just something that happened to work for me. I, I've tried every diet down through the years. The, the high fat, the low carb, the high carb, the this, that, and the other. I've, you know, I've I've tried them all. I've been very lucky in that I've never struggled with my weight as a as a rider. Uh, even even when I'm out of shape, it's only a matter of a few kilos. It's not it's not too too bad. But just for for completely unrelated reasons, around about a year ago, I uh, became a vegetarian, and, and uh, I also started to relax a lot more and having a few. Belgian Leffe beers or Duvels uh, a few more times per week, especially in lockdown. Um, and, you know, as we always say, correlation isn't causation, but since I've started doing that, I, I can't I can't put on weight. I, I just seem to lose more and more. So, <laughs> the, as I said, that's the honest answer. It's not uh, it's not what I recommend. It's certainly, it might, might work for my performance, but it definitely doesn't work in terms of uh, health, um, you know, when, when you're talking about the, the alcohol, but um, that's what I've been doing the last few months and it's, it's, it's worked quite well. And the few days beforehand, I did a few things just to try and make sure that I was, you know, um, only carrying a fuel source rather than carrying, you know, 
loads of fiber or whatever it might be or you know I, I wanted to be hydrated but not over hydrated so you know there was there was a few things I did around that just uh, to sort of make sure that I had enough but not too much um, but yeah it, uh, on, on the day I, I had a crazy amount of crazy amount of fuel uh, I had a really great team that were, were helping me out and every time I come up the, the climb they handed me a bottle uh, I would say nine times out of ten it was a um, it's it's a it's a it's an energy drink we have here. I'm not sure if it's available elsewhere, but it's, it's called Better Fuel. Um, SIS make it their fairly known brand. Okay. And yeah. It's got 80 grams of carbohydrates per bottle, and I was drinking, a, you know, a pretty much a bottle per hour. Uh, I was also taking an energy bar, and at one stage, quite often, I was eating boiled potatoes, which you know. Being oh. Irish, I suppose. Yeah. Well. <laughs> um, it, uh, they, they're so easy to digest, and you know they, they do the exact same job. So yeah, uh, yeah. The, I, I, I had a crazy amount of uh, fuel intake for during the ride. Wow. Well, like, give me. Do you have an estimate of like caloric intake? Uh, I don't. I, I know that you know uh, it's only one part of the picture, but on on my computer head unit, I had burnt seventy two hundred kilojoules at the end of the ride. Wow. Um, so wow. quite quite a few, um, and I estimate, roughly speaking, I was probably above what's considered the upper limit for carbohydrate intake at 120 grams per hour. But yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky again that I have a pretty good stomach that can uh, that can tolerate can tolerate the uh, extra food and extra fluids and all that it was taken in, and it never caused me any any issues. Yeah. Wow, that's 7,200 kilojoules. <laughs> that's a big day out, yeah. That's, so I guess, uh, which it does take me to, so kind of split the time up for people, like how much time climbing, how much time descending per lap? Yeah, it was roughly speaking about, say, four and a half, four minutes, 40 per ascent, and okay. um, roughly speaking about 40 seconds per descent. And okay. as I said earlier, I think, uh, a couple of laps that I wasn't able to maintain my aerodynamic tuck and and you know get myself as small as possible. I was losing 10, 12, 15 seconds on those two laps. Uh, now, granted, I was taking my overshoes off because my it dried out and my feet started to overheat. But you know, it's uh, just coming back to what we were saying earlier. The the descent is is so important in this and can quite often get overlooked. Like, and if you're losing 15 seconds per lap and 80 laps, that's you know it's a huge yeah. huge uh, a loss for for no reason really like for, for no effort basically right right and then power wise climbing so you're 14 percent average grade for four and a half minutes which is just, <laughs> that alone makes me hurt just thinking about it um but but it's actually it's bending up as you climb and so you're finishing out at at 24 uh, percent i mean what what sort of were you just trying to maintain your constant power or did you have a strategy there? Uh, I had, um, uh, again, with another caveat, I had the limiters of my rate of perceived exertion and heart rate as the number one uh, factors on the day. Um, but I did I did use power to a certain extent. I used VAM as well. Um, but um, the power that I was sort of thinking about was I'd worked out through testing before the event what sort of rates I was... Um, producing lactate and what sort of rates I was combusting lactate at, at different efforts. And uh, basically what I figured out was that if I rode at 370 watts to get over the steepest sections, uh, and then at the bottom, uh, once I got myself back to speed, rode at 300 watts um, for, for the first minute or so, I was able to undo the damage that I'd done from going harder at the top. And it allowed me to recover in time to go hard again. <laughs> And I was just trying to reduce the amount of time that I was going, you know, reduce the time that I was going slowly as much as possible. Although I was going slowly all the time, um, I was trying to reduce the slowest portions. Um, but yeah, it ended up at the end of the seven and a half hours, with the last two laps being, you know, pretty easy. Just sort of trying to soak in what I had just done and, and sort of enjoy it, and give everybody who was at the top helping me time to get down to the bottom for the final descent. Um, even with those last two laps being pretty easy in comparison to the rest, I had a normalized power of 299 for seven and a half hours. So, wow. Uh, again, it was a pretty big day. Out. That's just massive. I mean, I 
it, it's also, it, it just hurts me to hear your, your 300 watts is your sort of recovery space. <laughs> no, <laughs> at the bottom remember, half of the Remember coin. what I said earlier, I'm, I'm good at 300 watts. I'm not good above it. I'm not good below it. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, gosh, that's amazing. So, I, I mean, I, I think just from a numbers perspective, I mean, all of that's just super impressive speaking to your physiology uh, and, and the, the, the training. I mean, one that you you were able to do this two weeks apart. I think that's a, you know, I, I think if I'd spent two years training and did this once, I probably wouldn't walk for two weeks, uh, you know, at this point in my life and that you, you did it two weeks apart and you took basically an hour out the second time um, is, it, I mean, is amazing. But then also hearing the, you're just thinking of you as a coach, right? Giving this as a, uh, as a workout, 84 minute and 40 second intervals uh, with uh with 40 second recovery time i'm pretty sure i'll get a phone call the next day saying I, yeah i'm moving to a new coach yeah <laughs> yes what what the hell are you doing to me right? uh, wow that's uh so i guess speak speak to that though you you as a as a coach do you uh do you coach yourself also i know that works for some and not for others it, it works for me just because of everything that i mentioned earlier that i've got going on and uh, the busy sort of life that I'm that I'm trying to maintain um, I, I previously had a had a coach because I, I do believe having a coach is better than being self-coached but I was just wasting so much of his time because I wasn't able to do the sessions that he had planned you know on the okay. days that he planned or the times that he planned so and they end up it was just a I, I wouldn't have been happy if someone was you know messing me about as much um, and I you know it wasn't messing him about it was just you know life gets in the way sometimes and yeah, yeah. Um, we sort of just said here look it's it's probably better I just try and look after myself as best I can and and if I find an hour that I didn't think I would have available to use that or if I lose an hour that I thought I had available then I don't have to panic because I can just restructure my own my own training so um, I am self-coached but you know, I, I, I do believe it's better to have a coach. Yeah. So what, what lessons from this are you, do you see integrating into, <laughs> into your coaching practice or your, your future training? Um, well, like the, um, I, I suppose more so than a lesson is just, a, an example in that I, I didn't ride the climb that much more often than the two Everesting attempts. And um, one day I went out to test some equipment um, I didn't do any seven or eight hour rides. And uh, I, you know, across the last few months, I accidentally did five hours twice where when I say accidentally, I just got the chance when I was out, the phone call came from home. Oh, if you're, we're going to the beach, if you want to meet us there. And it meant I could get an extra two hours onto my three hour ride. So, um, you know, but, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that you know, a, a lot of the time the focus goes on to, you know, what's the specifics of an event and I, I didn't do eight hour rides and I didn't do multiple repeats of, of a hill climb. Uh, I just tried to focus on getting myself as strong and as fit as possible and um, it's, it's not the most scientific approach but the idea was that if I do plenty of training above and below, just above and just below the threshold then that'll prepare me for it and if I do a few spins of three to four hours that's you know all at tempo you know in in a in a pretty pretty big gear then you know that's going to replicate the effort and on the day I, I didn't yes i had to do nearly twice as much time as that but i was getting 40 seconds of rest every four minutes so <laughs> it made it a lot more manageable so yeah it's a i suppose a, a good lesson to take away from it is that um you know, you, you don't have to be trying to replicate the event perfectly. It's, you know, we can we can make make the best out of the situations that we have uh, and, and, and still prepare perfectly for, or, you know, prefer, prefer enough for whatever it is we're targeting. Yeah. So, are you going to do it again? <laughs> is it too soon? <laughs> um, well, if, if it's... If if the first attempt is anything to go off with about two or three days later, I was still saying I'm never doing that again. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, in the back of my head, the cogs were turning and they were saying, but you can go quicker. Why, why aren't you going to do it again? Um, and, and right now, uh, 
I was going to say right now, I'm still saying never again, but I'm well, I'm well past saying never again. Like I, I <laughs> genuinely feel there is, there is a, a, a genuinely feel that there is gains to be had there. Um, and, and the sub seven hour mark is, is when you do 704, you can do 659. Yeah. Um, so I, I think this is my way of sort of coming to terms with the fact that I'm probably going to have to do it again, even though I really don't want to. <laughs> Which is amazing, amazing. Well, if 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 you do, um, you know, I I've been did some math. I looked at the some of the, the power stuff and the 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 route and and I don't know some of the the arrow data that we've got on uh, to make some approximations. And I, you're you, yes, you, you can absolutely break seven. I, I hate don't to say this to me, but there's there, there's some there's actually still some low hanging fruit. Um, uh, there that I, I think there's a couple things in my calculations I think we, we could have done that this this attempt would have broken seven. Um, well, the so. the really uh, scary thing about that is that both before both of the times I did the Everest thing, I, I had slightly modeled the event to see what time it could come out with, and on both occasions it was accurate to within two or three percent. Um, I didn't believe it on both occasions because especially the second time it was telling me I was going to beat Contador um, and all models are wrong as we know just some are useful and it turns out this one was incredibly useful because it was actually two or three percent inaccurate in, in the in the right direction and that it was telling me I was going to go uh, 709 or something like that I think okay. uh, and I ended up doing 704 I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head but if you're now telling me that we can go below seven hours, um, <laughs> you 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 may just have convinced me right here, right now that um, we need to go again um, because you know I, even though I thought it in my head, I, I could have talked myself out of it, telling myself I was wrong. But if that's two people saying it, it must be right. <laughs> Uh, well, if, if, if we have just talked you into it, then uh, awesome. <laughs> we, we could have a lot of fun with that. I, I will say, though, in, in that, so speak, this is a great point. You know, we've talked a lot on this podcast um, about the mental aspect, you know, placebo effect and these things. But, I, you know, speak to that as, as an athlete and a coach. The mental piece of this is so, so, so big, right? I mean, we, you know, all the me modeling it and saying, yes, you do this power and you do these things and you go this fast. But of course, that's the super simplified version of, you know, you for seven hours self-talking, right? <laughs> the pain, this hurts. <laughs> Can I, so I guess talk, talk to uh, maybe your, your strategy for that. Um, I think it was, uh, I think it was my wife who said it, it, it must be the male equivalent of childbirth. Um, because you can forget about how hard it was so quickly or not so quickly but you can forget about how hard it was and go back and do it again and in, in my head both attempts were three or four rides up the hill um, whereas you know the first time was 64 and the second time was 80 times up it but I can only really remember three or four rides and what I, what I tried to do was just not to think that far ahead and um, I, I give myself a job for each segment of, of the lap so as soon as I started at the bottom, the job was to open my uh, flight suit, uh, open the vent on the helmet. Um, uh, when I got near the top, the job was to take a drink, get the turnaround right, uh, then immediately close the helmet, zip up the flight suit, uh, get into the super top position, get my chin below the front of the handlebars. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's two rivet or two sort of divots on the descent that if you hit them fast enough at the right angle, you get air. So I was trying to oh, avoid wow. those every lap, uh, and then immediately at the bottom, hit the lap button on the Garmin and compare that lap's time to every other lap. So I'd, I'd sort of given myself five or six jobs throughout the lap that, you know, when you're focusing on that all the time, I find you can get ten through ten or fifteen laps without even thinking about it. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, and you've also got the fact that you're. You know, you, you are pushing quite hard, so your brain maybe doesn't have enough oxygen to think too clearly anyway. So <laughs> it's, uh, it it works out that way. Oh, I love it. I love no, I, I love the uh, the the thinking, the mechanics. I mean, that's uh, you know a technique we see. It's a lot. That's race car driving right there. You know, a lot of the how do you handle the speed? The, you know, they're like, well, I'm thinking, I'm just doing the mechanics. It's, it's yeah. the shift point. It's the you know, and that's and the other thing I thought was. 
if I do start thinking about the negative aspects of it, where do I start? Like on the second attempt, it rained for the first two hours and I can't control that. Right. <laughs> so I just tried to tell myself this is not rain, it's coolant falling from the sky. <laughs> uh, and, you know, if I start thinking about the fact that it's Alberto Contador who I'm trying to topple and everything that he's done, you know, I, I, there's no sense in me thinking about, you know, what, what his ride or what he's done. I just have to concentrate on my own ride and if I then start thinking about the fact that I have to do it 80 times, well, you know, I've only got myself to blame for that. So <laughs> there's, there's no sense in, in stressing about that either. So yeah, it's just, um, I've said a few times since that one of my talents is ignorance and, you know, in, in some ways it's, it's one of the best to have in that. <laughs> don't, don't think about it, just do it. Oh, excellent. Excellent. All right. Awesome. Well, Ronan, this, this has just been, an, an awesome discussion and uh hopefully we can we can pick this one back up uh as we work on that next attempt maybe <laughs> and then With we'll talk help. to you again if uh, then we'll talk to you again about and see how that one goes i'll, I'll do it uh i'll do it on uh, one condition is that i have yours and silka's uh help um, because uh certainly without the without the lube and without the super secret uh chain lube and the speed shields and um, I'm starting to get a mind blank now, but everything that I had <laughs> bought from you across the last few months, uh, there's certainly God knows how many minutes that I gained in there. So um, um, if you're going to tell me you can gain me more again, uh, I'd be up for it. Yeah, no, I, I'm confident we can. And, and actually none of them through Soka products, so no self-plugging you know, <laughs> in, in there. But uh, no, I, I did love your email though, where you actually apologized for, uh, you, you said, I, I did have Silka handlebar tape, but I took it off when I cut the bars. <laughs> and I just I really had to laugh at that one. And just imagine the frantic untaping and the cutting. And the, uh, uh, that's, that's awesome. I, mean, I, just, I love the story. I, I just love what you've done is just amazing and inspiring uh, for all of us. And, you know, maybe we, we had Jordan Rapp, the uh, Zwift game designer, on uh, a few months ago. And so, you know, maybe we should talk to Jordan about making a, an Everesting, um, an Everesting event in Zwift, you know, get those, uh, the, the 84 minute intervals. Well, just coincidentally, the very first night I rode that S-Works SL6 that I used for the Everesting, I listened to that Jordan Rapp episode of the podcast and so just a, a nice wee coincidence there. That's oh, a, well, maybe, maybe we make it come full circle, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, so the people at home can experience the, uh, actually would be pretty cool, especially if you had the, um, uh, what is it? The Wahoo, the climb, the, the thing that does the elevation. Yeah. To yeah. Experience the 24% grade. I, I tried, yeah. I tried a virtual Everesting actually, um, in, in April time. Um, but the very first ascent of, I was going to do it in Opta Zwift, it wouldn't be perfect for it, but I was going to do it in Opta Zwift. The very first ascent, uh, my turbo trainer that I've had for four years decided to break down on me and, and <laughs> actually had to get replaced. It never worked again. So, um, <laughs> that, that was my first attempt at an Everest thing that didn't work out. Uh, you destroyed a trainer, Everesting. So Coincidentally. Yeah, well, Coincidentally. <laughs> uh, I'm going to call it impressive. I <laughs> I'm going to call it impressive. All right, Ronan McLaughlin, thank you so much for your time. It's such a pleasure talking to you, and uh, we definitely look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you for having me on the show. Cheers.